Ensbridge with more on our top story, the arrival of the Matthew in Bonavista, Newfoundland. John Cabot was one of the most famous explorers of all time, yet very little is known about him. CBC Newfoundland has put together a history series that answers part of the puzzle. Here now, the CBC's Marie Wadden with an excerpt from Giovanni Caboto and Voyage to the Happy Island. It all started in 1497 when a small English ship first came to the shores of the Beothic's Happy Island. Our Venetian, who went with a small ship from Bristol to find New Island, has come back and says he has discovered, 700 leagues off, the mainland of the country of the Grand Chan. In this kingdom, there is a certain Venetian named Zoane Cabot. We simply don't know when the Cabot family or Caboto family came to Venice. It was obviously before 1461, because that was the year in which Giovanni Caboto, son of Giulio Caboto, was noted as having been in Venice, you see. Venetian citizenship had many advantages for the young Italian. Venice was the hub of the Mediterranean. Seagoing merchants brought back stories of exotic lands and vast riches. It's believed Caboto grew up comfortably, the son of a merchant. A life of ease would have given him the freedom to dream. To dream of adventure in faraway places. Spices from Asia helped fuel the Mediterranean economy in the 15th century. But Turkey controlled the best route to the Far East and fought hard to protect that advantage. The Mediterranean merchants were eager to find a way around the Turks. Caboto believed he'd found a better route than his more famous compatriot, Christopher Columbus. He pestered Ferdinand de Sibylla to back him for a voyage into the West. What would he have had to offer? He would have had to offer uh, a possible voyage in a higher latitude. Caboto's idea was simple. A voyage that starts in the north, he argued, would be much shorter than one that originates closer to the equator. When Spain turned him down, he went north to England. Caboto got backing from the influential merchants of Bristol. Only then did King Henry VII give his blessing. What do we know about John Cabot? Well, most of the information we have are in these, you know, three letters. He is with his Venetian wife and his sons of Bristol. It's the gossip that's around town at that time. He entrusted his fortune to a small vessel with a crew of 18 persons. He has been away three months on the voyage. These would be diplomatic letters. Uh, one is to uh, Milan, one's to Venice, where the person writing the letter is kind of reporting the gossip in London, as it were. And then there's this day letter. Wind was east, northeast. It's a letter from an English sort of, well, he's an intelligence agent, basically, for the Spanish, and he writes Columbus. They left England toward the end of May and must have been on the way 35 days before sighting land. As far as I can make out, what he did was to go to uh, uh, Dursey Head, or off Dursey Head, and decide to keep on the same latitude as far as possible. Thus, your lordship will know that the cape nearest to Ireland is 1,800 miles west of Dursey Head, which is in Ireland. It seems almost certain to me that he landed, uh, or uh, that he, he, he encountered Newfoundland uh, right at its northern tip. After a sea voyage of their own, historians David Quinn and Samuel Morrison believe Caboto would have gotten off the ship 
at a small harbor called Gricket. Through their letters, John Day and those gossipy Italians tell us what happened next. My most illustrious and most excellent lord. He has been away three months on the voyage. That is certain. The said Messer Zoan, being a foreigner and poor, would not be believed if the crew, who were nearly all English, had not testified that what he said was the truth. Two or three days before finding land. They affirm that the sea is full of fish. And your lordship will know that he landed at only one spot of the mainland, near the place where land was first sighted. His name is Juan Talbot. And they disembarked there with a crucifix, Great honor raised you. banners, the arms of the Holy Father, and those of the King of England. The Canadian academic wisdom is that basically the landfall is, is somewhere near the Strait of Belle Isle. And I think this is based usually on the idea that he would have done latitude sailing, that is, gone up to a particular uh, distance north or south, and then tried to stay on that latitude. That was a way of keeping track of where you were, because the latitude was the one thing that you could check with the instruments of the time. You couldn't check the longitude. But Messer Zoan has set his mind on higher things. He exaggerates his uh, discoveries as much as possible, as well as the jewels, so that he can get uh, support from the crown uh, to make a large, vo uh, a larger expedition across the Atlantic. So anyway, he sets out in 1498. I think he's got five ships, uh, and he's got a bunch of investors. He's got the king putting some money in. One of the ships turned back for some reason and came into an Irish port. That wasn't Cabot. Cabot seemed to have carried on. We don't hear of him again, and we don't hear any direct results from those vessels. So he just disappears. It's like one of the great mariners of early modern times disappears. And you know, within a few decades, he's, he's forgotten. Kaboto's death was a blow for those who had backed his voyage and a tragedy for his family left on their own in a foreign country. His Italian-born wife, Matea, for whom his ship, the Matthew, was probably named, was left with three sons to raise on her own. Kaboto's death seems to have also put a damper on England's overseas adventures. Had Cabot remained alive and uh, uh, effective in Bristol, I think that uh, further voyages, even if only for fishing, uh, would have uh, been followed uh, fairly rapidly. In his mind, he was being another Marco Polo using a different route. He was going to be dealing with, you know, the con of of China or the Emperor of Japan, uh, but that wasn't the case. In fact, he was going to be dealing with various small groups of hunter-gatherers, some of whom might not really have appreciated his sudden presence in their territories. 